Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar dedicated to ventilation in the setting of COVID-19. Um, my name is Claude Guérin from Lyon, France, and our speaker today is Luigi Camparota. I'm very happy to introduce him. He's from London, affiliated in uh, King's College, and he has been involved in the Berlin definition for ARDS some years ago, and is currently as a deputy chair of the acute respiratory failure section of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. So, thank you so much, uh, Luigi, for being here, and let's go for 30 minutes of talk, after which we'll have a 30 minutes further for answer and questions. afternoon depending where you are so it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, I think the title is uh, quite ambitious because obviously clearly implies there is a correct way to ventilate patients with COVID-19 patients but well all I want to do this afternoon is just share with you a model or at least a ventilation that is based on a, co a conceptual model uh, that reflects the faces of this disease. So first of all, just the first slide, you can see that United Kingdom is rapidly catching up with the rest of Europe in terms of numbers, confirmed cases. And here, GSTT, Agassiz St. Thomas, as you can see the curve of patients who are ventilated uh, with COVID is rapidly increasing, reflecting the kinetic of the um, pandemic uh, in Europe and in UK. Now, this is not, I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is a very preliminary data just for you to see, but actually you can see the number of patients, the, the driving pressure, and the ventilator days and mainly have a moderate severe uh, P, uh, PF ratio that is compatible with a moderate severe disease. But I think it's important to look back and think what, how these patients present from a, an hypoxemic perspective. So the hypoxemia in these patients is mainly threefold. It's due to a dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion, which is very important. And I think the role of the pulmonary microthrombosis is becoming more and more relevant and perhaps we'll learn more in the future about the, the pathological and also therapeutic um, um, importance of the microthrombosis. And finally, on the other side of the spectrum, there is the frank pulmonary edema, which I, here I define as ARDS-like and hopefully will make sense in a second where uh, the reason why I'm saying ARDS-like. So if you compare these two chest x-rays uh, of patients with similar PF ratio but very clearly have got different pathology and still they're both COVID-19 positive. And equally you can see the CT scan and the patterns varies from your left to the right from a ground glass, very limited consolidation to on your uh, right hand side, quite frank consolidation, which resembles more ARDS. So if we think about it and the way we conceptualize the hypoxemia is the dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion first, which um, when associated with the mechanical characteristics of these patients and the radiological appearance, um, there is a pattern there that links the hypoxemia with a low elastance or so high compliance, a low VQ matching, a low recruitability, and therefore a limited response to PEEP. And the microthrombosis is there, which obviously creates not only difficulty in lung perfusion and hypoxemia, but also some dead space and therefore increase in carbon dioxide. And on the other side, there is a, the collapse or the edema, the ARDS-like, which has a high lung elastance, higher recruitability compared to the other type, 
and um, a shunt that is more substantial, and they respond or they respond to higher PEEP and prone positioning. So um, this is with uh, Professor Gattinoni and uh, other co-workers has been uh, named as phenotype L, and L stands for low, low everything, low elastance, VQ, recrucibility, and limited PEEP response. And in contrast, the other one is a phenotype H, so I think it's very important when we conceptualize and we see these patients at the bedside to start a early categorization into these two phenotypes because the treatment or at least the management is quite different. But also it's important, you can see the arrow that I put there, that some of the phenotype L obviously will progress into a phenotype H depending either on disease progression but also the way we manage uh, early, the early management of phenotype L. And this is, you can see this picture again taken from an editorial that will be impressed very soon. And you can see that despite the same PF ratio, the CT scan appearance is completely different and the distribution of normal lung and consolidated lung is, uh, is a quite different between the two categories. And I think the important one is actually the effect of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on the ACE2 receptor and some of the uh, differential effects on the angiotensin receptor one and two. And you can see the one as a, um, at the beginning, there is a profound visodilatory effect where the shunt and the abolition of um, uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction prevails, but then later on there is inflammation, there is vasoconstriction and there is um, fibrosis. So when you compare it with the classical definition of ARDS, you can see that um, the COVID-19 actually doesn't fit uh, strictly the, uh, all the criteria of the Berlin definition. It doesn't fit the timing very well. Some of these patients present quite late. Uh, it doesn't fit the chest imaging, uh, um, at least for the phenotype L, which is the majority of the COVID-19 presentation. And, um, and you can see the oxygenation criteria remain relevant. So the first point is COVID-19 pneumonitis might not be similar or equal to ARDS. And so based on that uh, initial two phenotypes, we are treating uh, these patients with respiratory failure, mainly hypoxemia from uh, COVID-19, uh, very differently depending on the two phenotypes. So there is a first stage where we want to assess shunt fraction and the severity of the hypoxemia. There is a second stage when we look at the risk of um, patient self-induced lung injury and therefore a possible the progression from L into H phenotype. And then we we screen for strain, so uh, the likelihood of an injurious ventilation in terms of tidal volume. And then in terms of PEEP and recruitment and prone positioning, an early identification of the phenotypes. And finally, uh, the um, failure and escalation strategy when we look for extracorporeal support. So I'm going to go briefly uh, all these stages so we can clarify this process and then maybe we can discuss um, different phases later on in the discussion phase. So the first thing is the non we do that with a 15 litres oxygen. We use a, a particular target, so 90 to 94, uh, and we may use uh, a, this might be an A&E or might be on the ward, and then we assess very early the work of breathing. Now, if the work of breathing is high, then it's very clear that this patient needs to be treated more aggressively because they might have a more fulminant disease, more hyperacute disease. I'll speak about this later on. Or if the work of breathing is low, a time-limited uh, use of, for example, non-invasive uh, CPAP or staying on oxygen can be uh, more prolonged. But I would say this has to be time-limited and with strict monitoring of work of breathing. Uh, 
And the reason for the auxin challenging is very simple. It is essentially the well-known um, concept of uh, estimation of shunt fraction. Essentially, if the SpO2 or the saturation does not increase uh, to a certain level, let's say above 95%, in all likelihood, the shunt fraction is elevated and uh, more in the range of 30 to 40 percent or higher. So these patients have got a moderate or a severe hypox uh, hypoxemia, which may not be easily reversible just with oxygen. I think the other thing to consider is the work of breathing and is to do with the respiratory drive. Now, the respiratory drive can have various sources. So clearly the hypoxemia uh, drive um, the increase in tidal volume, therefore increases the swings in esophageal and pleural pressure, which has an effect on stress and strain of the lung. The other important point on the other side is the pulmonary edema. That leads to an elastic work of breathing and an increase in respiratory rate. So in a way, when the respiratory rate increases, already there is the, the stage of increase in tidal volume is, uh, is, is passed and therefore the disease is more severe. There is also the metabolic drive. Some of these patients are incredibly inflammatory and febrile, uh, and the oxygen consumption and demand is increased, and that leads to the respiratory drive. But I think what is coming more clear in the literature now is the neurotropism of, this pa of the SARS-CoV-2, particularly around the midbrain on the respiratory and cardiovascular control. So some of these patients might have a quite significant work of breathing, but they don't perceive it. So the subjective dyspnea might, not, might be um, uh, less pronounced respect, uh, compared to the work of breathing. So I think what can we do? Obviously the FiO2, uh, is, in, is an important first measure. And the other thing is things that we can improve VQ matching. So maybe prone position in these patients might work very well. On the other side, for the, for the elastic work of breathing, we need certainly mechanical support and sometimes pharmacological support to control the respiratory rate and therefore uh, the, uh, the stress and strain of the lung. But I think the neurotropism is important and has to do with delirium, cognition, the frequently reported anosmia that some of these patients present with, and clearly the cardiorespiratory compromise, um, which some some patients have to the extreme of having an unexplained cardiac arrest. So the question is what to do next and clearly there are a series of options. Some of them are um, to do with uh, medical choice and others sometimes organizational and I think there are consideration. One Certainly, the infection control is a big issue. In some hospitals, the use of high flow is not allowed because of the infection control issues. The other consideration is about the support that the patient actually requires, both in terms of respiratory um, uh, work of breathing, but also how likely is this patient to fail, uh, the degree of apoxemia, the tolerance to the interface, for example, and the control of the transpulmonary pressure. The other consideration, which is quite important, this is not a disease that is easily reversible in, in, uh, in one day or two days, like, for example, might be a, a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So it might be less um, responsive to a uh, short duration of um, positive pressure ventilation, but I'll tell you all about it or a little bit more later on in the course of the talk. And the fourth consideration is clearly resources, resources in terms of ICU beds, in terms of staffing, availability of, of ventilators, and clearly oxygen. Some of these um, high flow oxygen or CPAP, they use an enormous quantity of oxygen and gas, and therefore that needs to be taken into consideration. So I'm just going to say something about oxygenation and clearly the oxygenation, we all know CPAP or non-invasive ventilation improve oxygenation, the PF ratio improves, 
but some of it has to do with the edema itself and the uh, some of the uh, um, effects on the alve al alveolar level but some other things has to do with more of a hemodynamic impact i mean you will remember all the this paper in 1979 which just basically shows how uh, the use of CPAP may be associated with a depression in cardiac output. And as the cardiac output goes down, you can see with a different PEEP, then the shunt fraction goes down. And therefore, there is an apparent increase in PF ratio, which is exclusively related to a change in um, um, shunt fraction. The other thing to consider is the failure rate. We can see this is from the lung safe data for the non-invasive ventilation in ARDS patients. And you can see that the survival probability of patients with moderate to severe uh, respiratory failure is certainly lower in patients who received a non-invasive ventilation. And on the right hand side, you can see the mortality uh, in blue and the mortality if NIVs failed in yellow. And clearly the um, failure rate is quite elevated in hypoxemic respiratory failure. And this is uh, all data from uh, uh, Massimo Antonelli and uh, you can see the intubation rate can be quite substantial. And um, even when compared to conventional oxygen therapy, NIV is associated with greater uh, intubation rate and lower survival. And NIV is a factor, an independent factor related to ICU mortality and 90 day mortality. But what is more important, I think, in this particular disease, the COVID-19, is that some of these patients might be uh, led to have sort of the use of non-invasive support might lead to a delayed intubation. You can see this is a study now in 2002 that shows an hypoxemic respiratory failure. Patients with de novo respiratory failure, in other words, they didn't have any previous cardiac or respiratory support, uh, and then they uh, die, they do not survive, the intubation, uh, there is a delay of few hours in the intubation of these patients. The other thing is about work of breathing. Clearly, CPAP or non-invasive ventilation can support work of breathing breathing but you can see that the work of breathing needs to be monitored clearly the the gold standard would be the the use of uh, esophageal pressure you can see a a, a movie there and a um, uh, waveform and you can see that if the work of breathing is excessive that will uh, dictate immediate intubation of this patient but also very interesting to see this data from the from Laurent Brochard group, you can see that the CPAP alone might not be very uh, efficient or effective at reducing elastic work of breathing, despite the fact that it might improve the pH, the PF ratio. And one of the things that we need to keep in mind, although sometimes with some CPAP machines might be difficult to measure, is the expired tidal volume. So here you can see two studies that show um, at the same time a uh, consistently that a tidal volume greater than 9.5 or 9 mils per kilo of body weight is associated with increased NIV failure and increased uh, mortality. So I think this can lead to a vicious circle where the impaired gas exchange and the low lung elastance uh, leads to an increase in respiratory drive, which increases the esophageal swings and increase the transpulmonary pressure that leads to capillary leak and in a very inflamed lung, lung edema, which uh, perpetuates the lung injury. And here, this is a perspective where the authors, Laurent Brochard, Slatsky and Pesenti, clearly say that sometimes a lung protective ventilation can be applied almost prophylactically, uh, prophylactically as a supportive therapy to minimize progression of disease. And this is, brings me to the next point, which is the course of the disease. I mean, you all have seen by now that uh, I think in my mind there are three patterns. There is a pattern where the severity is very high, the disease is hyperacute, uh, the hypoxemia is, is severe, the breathlessness is severe, and that leads to immediate intubation. 
However, there is a more indolent or even improving course where there is moderate or severe hypoxemia, but only moderate work of breathing. And patients might be ventilated invasively or often non-invasively for a number of days until there is the biphasic response where uh, after initial indolent course, there is a, a react, uh, there is a biphasic with an increase in severity, which can be very acute after five to seven days, and the deterioration can be associated with hyperinflammation. So these patients are um, CRP goes up, the ferritin goes up, the lymphocyte count goes up. They are febrile and they need multiple organ support. And so that's why we go into the intubation phase where we uh, look at strain. So the first thing we do, uh, we um, ventilate them in uh, volume control. and uh, In that way, we can measure the driving pressure. And we don't use super low tidal volumes. Some of these patients who have said about 60% of these patients have completely normal compliance. And we don't want to underventilate um, uh, and cause hypoventilation atelectomy in these patients. So we check the driving pressure. If the driving pressure is less than 15, we keep them at eight mils per kilo. And if it's um, greater than 15, clearly the gas volume uh, or the lung volume is small and therefore we reduce the tidal volume to match, uh, to match that strain. And we continue to tit up titrate the PEEP if required to meet some targets. Um, but we don't go higher than 15 of PEEP pressure because clearly we don't know at this stage um, the, the, the phenotype. And we want to characterize the phenotype before we, uh, we can um, um, optimize the ventilation. So once we increase the PEEP up to a certain level, then we look at the compliance. If the compliance is low, um, so less than 14, or th than 40, uh, or greater than 40. And this is because of these two pictures. So on the left, you can see a patient with a full lung, completely normal, and the other one you can see with a small lung volume. Clearly, these two patients, regardless of the level of hypoxemia, uh, whether it might be similar, they need to be treated differently. And what we do is, if the compliance is near normal, then the first thing we do is prone position. So clearly we want to optimize the VQ matching and perhaps a trial of a pulmonary vascular reactivity test with some pulmonary vasodilators. However, if the compliance is less than 40 or is compromised, in that case we know the FRC is reduced, the, the um, uh, lung volume is smaller and might respond to PEEP uh, or to short uh, uh, recruitment maneuvers. And sometimes we use uh, airway pressure release ventilation to improve recruitment and maintain alveolar stability. This is just a little video just uh, to show the effect of the inspiratory time on alveolar stability. And this is one of the modalities that we use uh, occasionally to increase the mean airway pressure, but at the same time maintain a lower peak or plateau pressure. Clearly, there is the phase where after trying prone position or a PRV for at least six hours or clearly sooner if light threatening, we need to make a decision if everything fails. And clearly some patients, you can see some chest X-ray below where there might be a rapid fulminant progression uh, uh, of the disease to an hyperinflammatory state that might need um, extracorporeal support and oxygenation cannot be maintained just with conventional treatment. And I think when we um, think about ECMO, well, in any condition, but certainly in a situation where the resources might be more difficult to manage in a situation of pandemics, uh, clearly we need to think um, of four questions. The first question is clearly, is the pathology reversible? Not the pathology necessarily that led to the respiratory failure in the first, uh, in the first instance, but the pathology that we are dealing with now. So the uh, hyper hyperinflammation, the multiple organ failure. 
And the second thing is to think about the patient. So is the patient able to recover? And they seem to be related questions, but they're actually very different. And if the patient able to recover has to do more with frailty, comorbidities, and the ability to sustain a prolonged course of ECMO and therefore rehabilitation, particularly in a situation where uh, resources in terms of rehabilitation, physiotherapy, etc., might be limited. The third and the fourth has to do with gas exchange and mechanical ventilation. So the third is, is the gas exchange so severe that it's life-threatening and we need to do something now? Or is the mechanical ventilation injurious? So the first two is about patient selection and the second two is about timing indication. Now, I think there are it might be in different countries, certainly in the UK, there are ways of looking at um, uh, these questions and also candidacy for ECMO. And clearly the uh, frailty scores might be uh, one of the things that uh, we need to look at. Uh, and some of the other scoring systems that although we don't use normally, uh, we might need to use it now in situations when uh, resources in general and ECMO resources might be more limited. And I want to conclude just with a picture uh, of four recent cases that we had of uh, COVID-19 who needed ECMO. And you can see the faces. You can see uh, on your top left is 34-year-old postpartum which uh, she followed an hyperacute um, course. So she became very un unwell very quickly, could not be oxygenated, could not be ventilated. And she was incredibly uh, inflamed. The second one on the, uh, all the three, the other three actually presented as a biphasic or delayed response. They've got, um, they are either 50, 46 or 32 year old. Biphasic in a way that received non-invasive ventilation first for two, three days, then intubated, some of them, uh, quite promptly, but without any uh, adverse events, but then remained ventilated for several days, sometimes five days, and you can see the progressive deterioration in this lung injury to the point that most of the lung is now consolidated, uh, you, the, the one on your left hand side, and you can see the top right actually having severe uh, barotrauma. And the bottom right is a more recent one, patient we um, admitted to the unit about two days ago, who uh, a 32-year-old male with a very severe hyperinflammatory phenotype with uh, hyperparexia, temperature of 41, uh, large doses of noradrenaline, and um, uh, ferritin was greater than 10,000, hyperitroglyceridemia, it's essentially the phenotype of an anti-inflammatory syndrome. And I would like with that to give you a summary, uh, which in my view uh, are things I've learned over the last few weeks. And clearly we come quite late compared to other countries such as Italy, for example. Uh, but anyway, these are my three points that I'd like to share. The first one is that early recognition of the hyperacute disease is important. Clearly a need for immediate intubation. And these patients are high risk of cardiovascular events. Some of them are related to the myocarditis process, but some of them might be centrally mediated, essentially with the effect of the virus into the midbrain and the cardiorespiratory control. The second point is that a short and judicious use of CPAP uh, might be useful uh, for hemodynamically stable patients with moderate hypoxemia, not severe hypoxemia, uh, particularly the ones have got low respiratory drive and low inflammatory phenotype. But I think we need to be aware uh, of the biphasic cause of the disease and some of these patients might fail quite late. And I think it's important to know about that to see where we can look after optimally this patient. And the third one is an early differentiation of the L phenotype. So this is the phenotype with preserved compliance with dysregulated pulmonary perfusion. Because in these patients, we need to balance the use of PEEP, uh, 
uh, with the perfusion. And um, sometimes the use of IP or PPFIO2 scales, as they've been published in the ARDS, sometimes some of the guidelines might not be beneficial and in fact they can be detrimental uh, and just i'd like to say that this phenotype is not ards and with that i i would like to thank you for your attention i i just stop here my presentation thank you thank you so much Rigi, for this uh, very very good talk and very impressive so there is a lot of questions for you um i received from from the from the staff and I would like to, to ask you uh, the following. The first is about the, the use of pre-oxygenation before intubation. What method do you recommend for that? Well, we use exclusively sort of low flow, non rebreathe mask. We don't use uh, high flow as a way of uh, pre-oxygenate. Um, so just, just a normal, um, um, non-rebreathing system, high 15 liters pre-oxygenation. And in the, uh, a related question, how much oxygen dose do you use to trigger intubation? Sorry, I, I, mi I missed that. How much oxygen? How many, how many oxygen, you know, flow? Uh, so in, in, with 15 minutes for you to intubate. So in terms of flow, we use we, we use just the low flow systems. So the the fifteen liters flow, we don't use the high flow systems. No, I, I mean the question was, uh, do you decide to intubate the patient? Let's say if they if he's if he's receiving something like fifteen liter per minute or oh, lower. Oh, or yeah. Yeah. So um, so we have a system where. Um, Essentially, we follow some targets. So we say that we are happy with a target of 90 to 94% saturation uh, with a greater than 40, with, with less than 40% oxygen. Now, these look particularly conservative targets, but actually, if we stop and think about um, um, sort of shun fraction, we can see that if a patient does not fit those criteria, will be on a saturation of 88% with maybe 45 to 50%. So to get them into the safe zone, we might need an excess of 60%. So I would say on average, some of our patients have got um, 60% to achieve 92. So at that point, if the work of breathing is elevated, I think we, we should preserve, um, uh, we should go for the intubation. Okay, um, there is a question about high flow oxygen versus non-invasive ventilation. What would well, you it, recommend? Well, it's a, very, it's a very good question. And outside the COVID situation, I would definitely say that we are great users of uh, high flow nasal cannula, na nasal oxygen, and the data are great. Unfortunately, um, there are two issues with the high flow nasal cannula. One is to do with the um, flow and the infection, uh, which obviously there is a risk for that. And exposing uh, the environment and other patients to that risk. And the other one is the use of oxygen. Clearly, 60 liters of oxygen limits the number and the duration of uh, this therapy, particularly in medium or even large hospitals. So um, we don't use it. Okay. Uh, and there is uh, several questions about, you know, the H and L phenotypes. Yes. Uh, it, is it really, are these two phenotypes really based, you know, or supported by data? Uh, in the real life and how to make it to recognize these two phenotypes. And there is a question about the use of the method uh, proposed by uh, Laurent Brochard and, uh, and Chen to measure the potential of recruitment. Do you think that may be yeah. useful for this recognition? I think great, great questions, obviously. And um, I think the L and H phenotype is, uh, th there is not, there is day well 
there is not a lot of clearly uh, observational longitudinal data. We are acquiring data as we see these patients, and it's just it's just a pattern recognition of the way they present and the mechanical, radiological, and gas exchange. So I think hopefully, as we look for these phenotypes more and more in clinical practice, we start accumulating data uh, which might inform um, practice in the future. So this is where we are at the moment. In terms of the um, uh, the method described by Lu Chen and Brochard, yes, absolutely, we use it. We use a modified one, but in later on, more into the sort of lower um, compliance, more into the age phenotype, when we see whether PEEP and recruitment will be of, um, of, of helpful or not. So to avoid excessive use of PEEP and uh, mechanical power. And there are, there are a lot of questions regarding as uh, the recruitment maneuvers, which is the, the best method you will recommend? And a related question is if you have a plateau pressure greater, greater than 30 centimeters of water, but with a, a decreasing in driving pressure with speed, do you keep a high peep or what do you do in this case? Do you pray, for instance? Yes, I think, I think um, so. The first question was about, um, so if we um, definitely sort of the, if if the driving pressure is to, the plateau pressure is greater than 30 um, and patient needs PEEP, I think the combination of prone position is great. Um, regarding the best use of, of recruitment, I'm not sure what is the best, but I uh, I can share what we think is the most practical, and what we are going, to, what we're doing is a short uh, 15, 10, 15 seconds uh, up 40 or plateau. That would be enough to give us an indication uh, of re of recruitment and see the effects without giving too long um, a higher pressure for too long. So we don't do decremental PEEP trials anymore. Uh, and that, I think, is for two reasons. One, it takes a long time, and we know that time is not exactly uh, abundant these days, and doctors are busy with lots of patients. And the other one is perhaps to do with the, some of the side effects that we might see, particularly after the ART trial. Okay, question about prone position first. What is your yeah. PF ratio to, to indicate prone position? And what do you think about the combination of yeah. prone position before intubation and either high oxygen flow or non-invasive ventilation? Yes, so we've started doing, so I'll start with your second question first. We started doing some autopro, at least we started planning autoproning and we've got a group of fantastic phys physiotherapists, very keen, um, uh, organizing some uh, autoproning on the ward, patients on oxygen. Uh, although we have not done it yet in a systematic way, but that's a plan for the future. Regarding the combination, I think um, for the L phenotype, we prone very early, because clearly the, there is a change in uh, in the distribution of pulmonary perfusion that might help the gas exchange. In the H phenotype, clearly the reason for proning is more similar to your trial, the, to the PROCEVA trial, so we use the same criteria. Okay. And there is also a, a series of questions related to the potential of thrombosis in case of COVID-19. And what what is your um, what is your opinion regarding the the anticoagulation treatment and uh, about the prevalence of pulmonary embolism in this setting? I think thank you for that because clearly it's coming across very strongly that um, uh, a proth um, COVID nineteen is a prothrombotic disease and um, the. Th Prothrombotic element might be mainly in the lung and not necessarily systemic. And this is due to the high inflammation. 
Now we've seen some, we've suspected some, we have not seen uh, catastrophic pulmonary emboli, although we've reported some uh, patients with pulmonary emboli. Um, but I think it's more on the microvasculature. Um, so for some of the patients, particularly with um, uh, no response to vasodilators, the, um, the compliance is not particularly decreased, uh, but the physiological dead space increases, so the carbon dioxide increases, maybe that might be an indication for um, some anticoagulation. Now, we don't go for full anticoagulation, although we are contemplating what's the best way to, to treat these patients and what level of anticoagulation, how to monitor it, whether it's 10A levels or APTTR or any other method. But I'm afraid I, we have not reached a final decision on that, although we are very conscious that this is a particularly important problem. Okay, so the, the questions are accumulating, so I try to filter a little bit. Uh, uh, a point about the inflammatory response uh, and three related questions. First, about the, the temperature control, the, the use of systems that are able to filter the cytokine's response, and a question about the steroids in this mm. uh, case, according to the recent trial by Villar, and co-workers in, in a non-COVID-19 ERDS. Yes, so, so in terms of technologies that absorb cytokines, um, we have not used them. And, and I think uh, there is a practical element to that. And essentially some of these patients are uh, accumulate quite rapidly. Uh, we've got many patients on our wards and um, in terms of also the um, use of staffing, I'm not, it's very difficult to deliver them at the scale that we need. Um, but the short answer is that we've not used it. So I've, I don't have a direct experience, although the uh, some of the literature can be quite encouraging. Um, in the non-COVID area, but I don't have a personal experience on that. Now, the steroids is a little bit more difficult because in a way we recognize this hyperinflammatory phenotype. So some of these patients either present from the beginning, very inflamed or developed later on a inflammation. We've got lung inflamm inflammation service here, guys at St. Thomas's, we're very lucky and we rely quite heavily on their advice. But from my, from what I can see, some of the patterns are they start recovering. So the uh, lymphocyte starts to recover, the um, CRP starts going up, the ferritin sometimes remains stable or goes back up and become uh, febrile and the inflammatory uh, infiltrates get worse and they get uh, essentially on high FiO2. At that point, uh, occasion, uh, sometimes we start some steroids at uh, uh, one milli milligram per kilo twice a day for a few days and see the response. But uh, most of these patients have to be single, single organ failure, not quite um, infected. We, are, we make sure that there is no sepsis or shock that might, might delay the uh, improvement of these patients. Uh, two, two other questions related to inflammation and coagulation. Do you use the uh, nebulized heparin? And what about the use of inhaled nitric oxide? Yes, very good. So I would start uh, just saying we don't use inhaled heparin. Uh, we use just um, um, parent sort of uh, intravenous or subcutaneous heparin, but not inhaled. Although I've seen lots of people starting to use it, but I don't have uh, that experience myself. And certainly in our group, we don't use it. Um, 